Before we begin, although this won't be the end of this channel, or even this series, more on that later, I just wanted to take the time to say that whether this is your first or fortieth time that you've given my videos a chance, thank you for everything. So with that said, spoilers for part three, watching and dreaming. Here's what I noticed while watching the final episode. In the 2020 New York Comic Con panel for the show, they revealed that an episode featuring Hootie's origin was cut, but it would be referenced in the finale. So, in Watching and Dreaming, we can see that there's a Hootie-like creature stemming from Papa Titan, aka the Monarch's hollowed eye. This means that more than likely, Hootie is a parasitic worm for Titans, and has been alive for maybe even longer than the thousands of years previously mentioned. It's even corroborated by the episode Follies at the Coven Day Parade, where we can see Hootie is actually able to shed his skin. So the hollow looking Hootie on the Monarch is an old skin that Hootie grew out of. This would make sense for why Hootie ended up at the Owl House as he, unknowingly, naturally gravitated towards the closest Titan he could find, King. The reason Stringbean is in the Nightmare with Luz is because Palsmen share telepathic links with their partners. This confirms that Palsmen can even enter their dreams too. Poor Albert. We can see that the statues of Bellos are holding the light spell in an attempt to exacerbate Luz's guilt for teaching Philip the light glyph. The transition to King's Nightmare is a reference to the first opening of the show. Since the Time Trappers were all the way on the other side of the world, the Collector either waited for them to sail over, then collected them, or he went there and collected them for just this occasion. Bill's eyes are the only main dream figure to be hollowed out because he's technically wearing a mask. Despite never being collected, several students still appear in Luce's nightmare. The Witch's Battle Flub from Puppet Amity was referencing the good Witch Azora story from Convention. The Lightglyph can break the Collector's spells because its magic is directly from the Titan. With all the anime stuff going on in this episode, I'm convinced that this clap is a Full Metal Alchemist reference. Considering that the Lightglyph was activated in close proximity to the puppets, it theoretically should have broken the collection on Ida and King's dream captors too. But for some reason, it didn't. Bellows slash Rain are technically the third people to hold Francois, after King then Lose, making the Collector the fourth. Bellows could have infected the beating heart of the Titan whenever he wanted to, and yet he didn't bother. This wasn't due to ignorance, he knew how meaningful the Titan was to witches, but he thought it was a load of hogwash since he looked down on them. Ironically, if he had just listened to and believed the lies that he was spreading, he could have completed his purge long before Luce was even born. The Collector doesn't understand the concept of death because the Archivist only ever collected and stored species until the Titans. The Archivist likely forbade the Collector from even attempting to bring them back even though they knew it wasn't possible. Another reason why the Collector doesn't understand death is because whenever Bellows killed off another Grimwalker, they would always come back. The Collector believed that Bellows was just fixing them. Some people have pointed out that Rain breaking out of the Collection spell doesn't make sense considering that it can only be countered by the much more potent Titan magic. However, the show actually did already establish that Witch's magic can be used against the Collector, like in For the Future when Lilith's powerful emotions were enough to break through a part of Hootie's Collection spell. So, Rain isn't just annoyingly powerful, they're so powerful that they manage to completely break the spell, which works within the established conventions of the show. Amity's only able to start moving again after she was left in the light. This could mean that light in general, not just the Titan magic variant, weakens the spell to some degree. This also means that more than likely, whenever the puppets were in the light, they were conscious of what was going on but had no control of their actions. Also, something I just realized while recording this is that whenever a Titan dies like King's dad at the end of the episode, they end up becoming a star in the night sky, so that would make sense on why the spell is weakened by light, because either way, it's technically Titan's magic. Hunter's puppet features a different colored outfit for some reason. The Collector's first game is a reference to Pac-Man, but it shares a striking similarity to a scene with the fairy in the first episode. Palastrome Wood is indeed able to damage the Collector as well. There are some sad faces on the marbles behind Ida. We can see that from the Collector's story that the Monarch in fact had two eyes before sealing the Collector away. 
He must have lost it at some point fighting back the Archivist, or he willingly removed it in hopes that someone would find it and could use it one day. Speaking of that, thanks to this episode, we can see that his eye holds a striking similarity to the one on the portal door and key. Since it was left in the backyard of the Clawthorne family home, we can reasonably conclude that at some point, Evelyn Clawthorne must have found the monarch's missing eye and harnessed its power into a carved portable case to travel between the realms. However, after her husband Caleb was killed by Bellows, she ran away and buried it in hopes that he, or anyone like him, would never be able to use its power again. This also explains how Bellows knew that a portal existed. The Collector must have been so desperate to find any Titans left that he asked the Titan Trappers to find the last one for him while he was trapped in his prison. However, they misinterpreted it as a request for a sacrifice, and the Collector misinterpreted what they were doing as playing a pretend game as, again, he didn't understand the concept of death. I guess Luz got to pick up and store all the non bellos related memory photos that they pulled out of her head from the previous episode. People manage to break into the castle and leave some strongly worded messages for Bellows. This isn't a reference to anything. No one say any- No! 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 If you don't count her poster from Agony of a Witch, this is Amity's first time having any sort of interaction with Lilith since episode 5, Convention. Something I missed from the last episode is that since no one who stayed inside of Hexide ended up being collected, Luz was totally right when she said in Volleys at the Coven Day Parade, There's no safer place than Hexide School of Magic and Demonics. Speaking of things that I missed, like I said, this won't be the last Owl House Things You Miss video because I'm planning on making a video going over things that I missed or got wrong throughout the second half of season two all the way through the end of the series. So if there ever was anything from the show that you noticed and I didn't mention in a previous video, post a comment on this video saying what it is, what episode it's from, and when it happens during the episode. Whoever's the first to mention something new will get their name featured in the video, unless you specifically say you don't want to. Just as Graham rolls to make the cut, again, it can't be something obvious and it must be something that I didn't already point out in a previous video. I'm looking forward to your comments and while you're here, please like and subscribe. You'd bake my day. <laughs> Bread bun. The Owl House teases Disney yet again when Lou says, Really? Now that's a spinoff I'd watch. This is referencing the young Ida spinoff that Dana Terra said that she'd be interested in pursuing if Disney ever wanted to greenlight it. Mytholomew's final major line was, It's him! Run! Go, 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 go! Ah! Somehow I knew he would go out running away and screaming. You know Amity and the Collector would get along just fine, considering that they said basically the exact same thing when they were showed Lucy's glyphs for the first time. The Dire Rat from Episode 4 struck back at Tanella. Because I saw some people were confused, the item that the Collector picks up is Rain's earring, which dropped when they were being held back by Bellows. Even though that she acknowledged that the destruction of the Boiling Isles was Bellos' fault, Luz still blamed herself for the part she played even after all the support from her loved ones. It isn't until this moment, when the Collector tries to be kind and is punished for it, that Luz realizes that just like them, it isn't her fault that she helped Bellos. The Collector was just trying to do the right thing and shouldn't be blamed for the betrayal of trust. This was the moment where Luce finally forgave herself. King is able to use the same light shield that Luce makes later in the episode. Strangely enough, it still uses the monarch's glyphs even though they directly state later in the episode that his powers use different glyphs. Ida's rage form all but confirms that the Owl Beast is in fact a form of Titan. The fact that the monarch is wearing clothing not available to him while he was trapped in the in-between, and he changes form right before he disappears, implies that he can either shift his form to be whatever he pleases, or his look is based on how whoever is speaking to him perceives him. Kind of like a certain other deity from the last episode of a certain other show. The monarch's dialogue referencing King's line from Enchanting Grom Fright, Now I am king and queen! Best of both things! Implies that the monarch is gender fluid or gender neutral. But dad works fine. The line, will you choose yourself, is a reference to the second episode of the show when Ida says, And that's why you need to choose yourself. Amity still isn't used to getting hugged by a supportive mom. 
Luz and a Titan being fused in a single body is such a cool concept. I can't believe that the show never did something like that before. Oh, oh, oh no, 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 that, that never happened. We agreed we would never talk about it again. Oh God, no! The spin move Ida King and Luz perform is a reference to the one used to stop the Warden in reaching out. The move is also a reference to enchanting Grom Fright. Camila learned how to make glyphs really quickly after the Camila glyph debacle in the last episode. Hunter's last major line of the series was, The Collector? Raising the Titan being Bellos' plan was actually foreshadowed in a deleted scene from Hunting Palisman. Also on the subject of the Titan, you can see a bunch of landmasses around him that, as far as we know, shouldn't have been there when the Archivist cleared the land away. They likely emerged from underwater after the Titan rose slightly. This is Luce's third time reciting her warrior a peace line once for each season. In the biggest plot twist of the entire series, Luz's once weak nerd arms are the very things that save the Boiling Isles. The Archive House, which is in the shape of a crown, lands on the monarch's skull because no monarch should be without their crown. In the end, Luz chose to be both full of optimism and goodness like the Good Witch Azora and have black nail polish and a mysteriously withdrawn attitude, as was foretold in Witches Before Wizards. Bellows is melting away due to the boiling rain, but man, water is the real MVP in fights against Bellows, huh? Bellows' final line of the series was, We're human. We're better than this. Rain's final major line of the series was, That was extremely satisfying. Truly a perfect last line. The monarch becomes a light glyph in the night sky after passing. This means that those star formation like lifts that we saw from Adventures in the Elements might be the past spirits of Titans that were wiped out by the Archivists. Even though that Luz didn't have her hat after getting lighted, she somehow got it back anyway when returning to her normal form. The demon hunting squad got to stick together after all this time. Looks like the two bakers from the Baker's Coven in Convention were a couple this whole time. The swirled faced person from Once Upon a Swap was at Hexide this whole time. In other news, Abomination Goo can apparently be acidic. Luce's moving box is filled with references, including this less obvious scroll of paper here that's either the map from her quest in Witches Before Wizards, or her first wanted poster from I Was a Teenage Abomination. If you look at the move-in date on Luce's note, it says that she's moving in on August 21st, just one day before her dad died according to Reaching Out. This means that Luce's narration about what happened was probably her telling all this to her father. There's a polypin from Amphibia hanging up her good grade. Speaking of which, Luz actually did end up getting good grades, proving that she was applying herself and that the solution wasn't to force her into a box, but to make her feel understood. Luz and V ended up graduating together in the human realm, meaning that Luz was likely going to school twice over, once in the human realm and once in the demon realm. But more than likely, she was homeschooled in the human realm. Luz's art skills did improve since she was featured as an artist at a comic convention. Looks like Dana Terrace sponsored a writing scholarship that Luz won, finally achieving her second dream too. Hootie was gonna conquer the human realm, but he decided to settle for some snacks from Robin instead. King finally got to play that game of catch with his family. Gus got some glasses by the time one of the future Groms came around. Stringbean has her own little corner with a legally distinct chef rat. Camila is making Luz's favorite food. Luz, surprise surprise, got accepted into Ida's school of wild magic. There's a mistake on Luz's major sheet since Curses 101 should be a class, not a major. Luz's outfit has some cool references, including a snake design for Stringbean, patches on her pants for the different tracks at Hexide, or maybe representing her friends? Plus, she's wearing Amity's Hecate necklace. Luz and V were on a baseball team together. Or it could be Masha. We get to see Stringbean's adorable Halloween costume. V's shirt of Gus's Human Realm Exchange program implies that she at last made peace with both the demon and human realms. There are snapdragons planted on the outside of the new Noceta house, the official plant of Raida. The collector's final line of the show was, Welcome to the Boiling Isles, watch your step. 
they actually managed to build housing on the risen arm of the Titan. Though considering how high it was from the shot in the upper atmosphere, I don't know how anyone could live up there. Willow's final outfit features her flyer derby team, the Emerald Entrails. Looks like Brachus ended up following the same path as Viney and joined the healing and beastkeeping tracks. Also thanks to Brachus, we know that braces exist in the Boiling Isles now and are being used for their intended purposes. Or maybe magnetism? According to Dana Terrace, Hunter's new palisman is named Waffle. Hunter is now taking care of himself since he no longer has bags under his eyes. Also, he somehow got his sigil removed even though that they only just managed to find the technology to remove it in that same sequence. Lilith has some great little notes on her blueprints, including a note to show off to Flora, a crudely written one from Hootie democratically electing himself as the curator, and of course, it will feature her all-important Deadwardian balusters. Amity actually managed to maintain the shape that Luz tried to form with Abomination Goo from escaping expulsion. Amity's explorer outfit is modeled after her father's lab coat and features crystals from her Grom tiara as part of the scrunchie holding up her hair. The book Amity discovered seems to go into the history of the Archivist and the Titans, but that's maybe a story for a sequel series. This student is modeled after Dana Terrace, complete with a logo pin on her beanie. It seems that the Illusion Instructor ended up becoming principal at Hexide, allowing Bump to at last get the retirement he mentioned from the first day. Even though Bump did retire, it seems he's still passionate about helping students where he can because he's featured in Lilith's notes as someone to talk to about a student exhibit. Bump is a follower of the Church of Hootsifer. The Skull of the Titan is the official symbol of the new Boiling Isles, which is why Luz's acceptance letter, the hospital lab coats, and the instructor's outfits all feature the symbol. The kid who got a sigil in convention is finally the first to be freed of Bellos's curse. Alador's outfit features jewels on his belt, representing each of his kids. After all this time, we finally got to see Rain's palisman, and they are a fox. Like, literally, they're, they're a fox. Since there's a human and demon realm exchange program, this implies that there are now more humans in the demon realm. It looks like these siblings finally managed to find peace in the demon realm. Ida and Rain seem to have swapped earrings. King's broken horn grew along with him. For those of you who are worried about King being the last of his kind, his father's gender neutrality could suggest that Titans can reproduce asexually, meaning that he can still produce an offspring without a second Titan. This would make sense on why we never heard any mention of King's mom. V's final major line was, Hurry, hurry! It looks like the Owl Gang made peace with some enemies since Basha and Tibbles are in the final card, and they actually seem happy to see Luz at her King Senyera. The little abomination blob in Aldor's pocket is a reference to Princess Bubblegum from Adventure Time. There's a possible mistake in the continuity. If they are indeed celebrating Luz's birthday on her actual birthday, then that means her birthday is sometime in August. Yet, according to Ida and King, she didn't turn 15 until after the events of Watching and Dreaming. Except it was November when that episode happened. In other sad news, if they are celebrating her actual birthday, that means her father died just days after one of her earlier ones. Amity's final major line of the series was, We wanted to make it up to you. Willow's final major line of the series was, Camila told us all about your King Sineras from the human realm. Gus's final major line of the series was, They sounded a lot less haunted than our birthdays. Lilith's final major line of the series was, Nevertheless, I made sure we followed Camila's instructions perfectly. Camila's final major line of the series was, Great work, everyone. Muy bueno. The poor Snagglebag just can't get a break when it comes to dangling off things he doesn't want to. And bonus fact, the character's voice actor is Aaron Hansen, the same one as the Monarch. I guess he really was the most powerful demon after all. Oh, oh, it's the Echo Mouse! It's the Echo Mouse! They're safe! They're all right! <laughs> An additional explanation on why King's Titan Blood didn't activate the Fire Glyph in Young Blood Old Souls is that his glyphs are actually different to his father's. Luz, Amity, Willow, Hunter, and Gus all got matching tattoos of Flapjack. Luz couldn't find the words at first, but she realized she wanted to thank Ida and King while drowning in the in-between. It was here, at the end of the episode, 
that she finally got her wish in her last conversational dialogue with them. King and Ida's final major line of the series was... Weirdos. Weirdos. And last but not least, before I hit you with the final fact of the show, thank you all for believing in me and taking the time to watch my content. Seriously, at the time of recording, I had only a little over 1,000 subscribers exactly one year ago, so I hope you'll continue to stick around to listen to me talk obsessively about The Owl House and other animated shows and movies, because I still have hours and hours and hours of stuff to talk about. Please like and subscribe if you haven't already, leave your comments of things that I missed, and stay wild, witches. I'll see you all on the Hex side. Or, in the words of Luz in everyone's final line of the show, Bye!